Welcome to the show. You are watching The Nth Degree TV. I'm your host, Tracy Tim. I'm so excited to have you here because it's Wednesday, which means we're bringing you another exciting interview that is all about career and finding work that you love. This, of course, like I said, is the place to be to find work that you love and to feel unstoppable again. And I'm super excited for today's guest because um, we were connected by mutual friends in the speaking world, and I was fortunate enough to be on this man's, uh, his own podcast, which was really fun. In fact, I think we filmed that yesterday. Time flies. Uh, but as we got to talking, I realized that he was going to be such an amazing resource for us here on the nth degree as well, because his background and expertise is all in respect and how to build and create cultures where people are respected and everybody feels equally and individually valued. And as you know, if you've ever been in a job that you hated, it's likely that you hated it partly because the people that you work with were not that fun to be around. So I'm really excited to introduce to you um, our guest today, Mike Domertz. Hey, Mike, so good to have you here. Hello, Tracy, thanks for having me on. Yay, okay, by the way, you have to tell me like 50 times how to pronounce your last name because I'm gonna screw it up infinitely. So So actually, if you think of the Amish culture and put a D in front of it, Damish. Dom, oh, there we go. Damish, that's super easy. You've done this once or twice, I can tell. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, not to look at my last name. Fair enough. I won't ever do that again. <laughs> well, again, I'm so excited to have you. So you have such a really, uh, I don't know, fascinating story. So I'd love for you to start by giving everybody a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I was a college student. It was uh, 1989. I was returning to my dorm room and I received a phone call from my mom. And the call was that the youngest of my older sisters, I have three older sisters, had been raped. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was angry, I was confused, I was hurt, I was lost. And that would take me on a journey of struggling for a few months. And I would transfer universities. And when I transferred universities, I was an athlete and we were mandated to go to the speaker. And I heard a speaker talk about sexual assault. And I realized, wait a second, I can use my voice to do something about this, to speak out about this. And that's where it all began. I went to that speaker and said, I'd love to do this. And he's like, well, lots of people say that, but you know, if you're really interested, come to my place, I'll give you what I got. And I showed up and he said, nobody ever shows up. So I'm gonna <laughs> give you what I got. And he gave me everything he got. I wrote a speech from that and I started speaking in schools. And that was 1990, 91. Wow. And here we are 28 years later. That's amazing. And so how how did you take and channel what was probably just a lot of rage and fear and, and all the things and, and turn it into something that was really powerful for change for people? Because um, I know plenty of people go through, right? We're, I bet you now, unfortunately, sexual assault and being related to it in some way is just as common as maybe cancer. And so, but not as many people take it and channel it and make something positive out of it. So how do you think you were able to do that? Well, it wasn't intentional at first. In other words, when I first started speaking, I was an angry brother. I was somebody coming out and saying, hey, this has to stop. And I came with that kind of an energy. I came with that kind of a passion. The problem with that is people don't want to engage with anger with frustration, Mm. unless they've already been involved in the topic or conversation. We were trying to reach everybody. So what happened was uh, I was in this classroom and a professor saw me doing this and said, hey, Mike, when you engage people, when you role play with people, it takes it to a whole nother level. They really light up. And I would slowly learn from that point on that I had to go from anger to engagement. I had Mm. to be able to engage with everyone's emotions of all kinds, humor, and thought provoking and emotion. And that shift made a huge difference in my work. And today that's what we're known for. We're known for being really engaging and giving people how to skills. So going beyond raising awareness to actually giving people skills they can implement into their life today, right now to improve their relationships, whether it's at work or it's at home or it's with family or friends, whoever it is, we wanna improve that on a basis and a foundation of respect. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you mentioned being an athlete and having to go to one of those seminars. And I don't remember if it was athlete specific, but I went to one freshman year mm -hmm. um, in college. And I remember it being really cheesy. Like we had these paddles that you were supposed to hold up that were like red and green and said like, oh, that's a stop, that's a go kind of thing. So I know the I know the exact presentation <laughs> you're referring to. Yeah. And, and the, by the way, that's why I'm stopping because there are people I know uh, and I I certainly don't want to say anything negative about them. We, oh, no, there's no, all no, no. Different, Yeah, there's all different approaches because their approach works for a lot of people. So there's a there's all different approaches out there. Uh, what we do, what I do specifically when I'm at the room is I'm talking about everyday situations the audience is in. So it's mm. not, a, it's, in my case, it's not about me, the performer, enlightening anyone. It's about me facilitating a conversation with whether there's 200 people in the room or 20,000 people in the room, where that room is at in their lives mm -hmm. and helping them break down barriers right there where they're at. Because sometimes there's married people in the room that aren't experiencing those situations that everybody assumes is the 18 to 22 year old. Sometimes there's very different groups and demographics. So we customize to the room. Now to do that, you can't be scripted. Right. So I'm not a script, I'm not scripted. So if somebody's looking for a scripted presentation that comes in and does A and then does B and then does C, well, that's not going to be us because here's the problem with that. Your audience doesn't follow the script. <laughs> right. Every audience member has their own life. Therefore, they have their own script. And so wow. you really want to have an expert who can bring out their stories, their scripts, and let it flow naturally where it needs to go to get people the skills they need and they're then they want to implement when you give them to it the right way. Right, right. Can you give us maybe an example of a recent um, engagement that you had or maybe one that really stands out in your mind that where you just connected and you saw that your ability to be unscripted and engaged in such a unique and targeted way really landed with somebody? So I'm really fortunate. We get we have a survey system we use at the end of my presentations during the presentation that gives me immediate feedback oh, that's uh, every great. time I walk off stage. Yes. So the fortunate part is when you ask that question, I get to say all of our presentations, I get to see that because we, be, yeah, because we literally get the feedback. To give you an example, we ask three behavioral changes that take place from them, their behaviors when they leave the room, that they're gonna engage in more likely than they did before they walked in the room. Asking first for sexual intimacy is a common one. Uh, another one is intervening in a party scene where somebody's using alcohol or drugs to try to hook up with someone, which is really facilitating a sexual assault and mm -hmm. supporting survivors. Three very specific behaviors. Now, here's a great example. April, Sunday night, I am speaking to 400 student athletes who are mandated at 8 p.m. to come hear me speak. Now, I don't know if you remember what happened in April, but that's called Game of Thrones. Yeah, oh, yes. Right, one of the final episodes of Game of Thrones. And they instead have to go to hear a mandated lecture on sexual assault. That's how they're viewing it in their mind, right? Right. So the energy, the energy is not good coming in. It, they're a wonderful audience, but there's a different energy level. It's Sunday night, we're missing this, we're mandated. And yet at the end of that presentation, when asked the question, those three questions we just gave you, they can go from strongly agree to agree, to disagree, to strongly disagree, to, and there's a neutral in there. 98% said they either agreed or strongly agreed with all three behavioral changes. And they, they probably never wanted to be there before they walked in. So that's a great example of when you're able to understand where your audience is at by letting them come forward with their life, their story, you can have powerful impact because it's about the audience, not about you. Right, yeah. Isn't that something we all need to be reminded of? <laughs> it's it's yeah. really interesting because you got into this, you know, to, I'm guessing with the ethos of like, I'm going to fight for the people I love and this cause that now I really have an emotional and a personal connection with. And then you, you know, had to grow and evolve and make it not about you, but about them and in an engagement, you know, way that really landed with an audience that, that let's be honest, doesn't necessarily take that topic seriously all the time. Um, so kudos to you. I'm, I'm curious now, though, because you and I were introduced with you as the head of this um, the whole movement, uh, the culture of respect. So how has what you taught in the early 90s evolved into really what you believe your movement is now? Yeah, so I'm with the Center for Respect. 
And we are, we are all about what you just said, creating a culture of respect and consent. Well, here's how it's evolved. 20 years ago, if I walked into a school audience, I walked into a college audience or any group I walked in, and I said, can a drunk person who is not of sound mind give consent? Everybody in the audience, almost everybody go, well, of course, yes is yes. Mm. Nowadays, if I walk in, even at a middle school, high school, college, military, corporation, and you were asked a question like that, almost the whole audience yells, well, of course not. Of course not, they're not of sound mind. So a great awareness has been risen in the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Here's where the challenge still, here's where the challenge lies though. If you look at their behaviors on Friday night, they're still pursuing the person who is not of sound mind. So mm -hmm. the challenge now is to get, we have awareness here and we need behaviors to match the awareness. That's today's challenge. We've got awareness, now we need behaviors to match that. And here's the other challenge today. Companies now realize they need to be discussing this. Small businesses, large businesses. See, when I started doing this work, it was schools. Then the mm -hmm. military came to us and said, Mike, we see you doing this universities. Can you do this for the military? You know, a big chunk of our audience is the same age group. And we came in doing work for the military. And they're like, whoa, whoa, you're actually relating to the married people too. So then we started doing leadership training and programs for the military. And then what happened with the companies recently, corporations the last two years, are suddenly going, uh-oh, we better discuss this or else. Sure. Now, the sad part is that early on, still now, a lot of companies are not addressing this. They're covering their rear ends. Yeah. But they're not addressing it as looking for cultural transformation. They're saying, what do we have to do to protect ourselves instead yeah. of what do we do to change the way we operate so this doesn't happen in the first place. And that's what we're brought in to do. We're brought in to really transform a culture of an organization so that it's a truly a place of respect versus, well, we, we do the right things. Well, let's have a look at that. Let's have a discussion on that. Is there, can you identify a reason why they wouldn't want or, or be driven to create that culture of change? Why it's really more of a CYA than it is a, we can get something positive out of making this change? Yeah, two reasons. One is the fear that if we don't bring in the right approach, this is gonna cause more harm. Mm. And there's some legitimate legitimacy to that. You need to have the right person. This is why you can't be scripted. Because if you go into a company program and somebody subs something in the audience that isn't in the script, you better be able to handle that masterfully. Yeah. You better be able to make that a learning moment. So one, it's they don't realize that there are experts out there. This is what we do. This is where we've been for two decades and we can help them with, remove that fear. The other one though is the idea that if we talk about it, things are gonna surface that we're not willing to address right now. Oh, but so why not? Why wouldn't they be willing to address it if it's, if it's Well, crucial? they run it from a place of fear. Oh. If the person who's doing that is running in a place of fear. They're thinking, if we bring in this program, what if five people come forward and report sexual harassment because they now recognize the way they were treated was inappropriate or somebody abused power, and what are we gonna do then? Instead of saying, let's make sure we have a space where if that ever happened to somebody in our organization, that we have a program that we've brought in that lets them know we're here for them. We support them. And that's where we need organizations to get to. By the way, this is much more than sexual harassment. Sure. Treating people with respect leads to retention, leads to way larger problem solving, way larger productivity. Wellness of employees shows to soar when they are in a place of respect. Harvard Business Review did an amazing, amazing research on this. The number one factor impacting employees was respect. And over 50% of those people on the survey said they didn't feel respected by their leadership or management. Wow. That's huge. That's, That's huge. kind of terrifying, so, isn't it? It is. And what they don't realize is they think, well, respect is not a bottom dollar issue. Well, yes, it is. You're losing people. You don't retain people. And in a market where unemployment's low, that's a major cost to your company. Now, what's sad is I need to say that part, <laughs> right? Because the, the sad part is if it's not bottom line, we don't care about people is the implication. The yeah. good news is the companies and the organizations that work with us care deeply about their people and their culture. So they don't fit that profile, right? Yeah. They're saying 
look, we understand our people are what matter. Without them, we don't have the product or the service. We're not who we are. So the people who work with us care deeply about their people and their culture. That's beautiful. So let's say that I'm looking for a new place to work and I'm coming from an environment that was less than respectful. Um, I personally have a little bit of background where I've been in a couple less than respectful environments. Um, so what am I looking for from a company that's going to prove to me that they value their people, they have a culture of respect and that there's support um, for this movement that you're talking about? Yeah, I'm going to listen to how they live their core values. Mm. I'm going to look at their core values and see if respect is in there. What's oh, in their core true. values? That, that, yeah, it is. And and then I'm going to, in the interview process, constantly be seeking out how they live that core value. Mm. I'm going to be listening for that. Or do I hear betrayals of that? Do I hear them telling me that they they honor family and they believe in family but only the family within the work environment, not your family at home, right? So I'm gonna listen for, you know, we may work, you know, we may really work people here, but you're gonna get this reward over here. But it almost sounds like we're giving you the reward because we're not treating you the best, so we have this extra reward over here for you. So mm -hmm. those are things to watch for that are very common. And yeah, I can see you're reacting to that because that's a common one, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we give you more of this stuff because we don't, we don't necessarily treat you. We don't create an environment that is great for your well-being necessarily. Now, don't get me wrong. There are companies who pay very well with amazing benefits who also take great care of their people. It's not like yeah. it's one or the other. I'm That's watching for the one that so focuses on all the rewards they're giving you because of the way you're going to be treated or the work environment. This is so beautiful. I'm really glad that you that you made that distinction because this is something I run into all the time with my work. There's this conception that we have that life or the career or whatever is black and white or all or nothing, right? That, okay, if I want to have impact and I want to love what I do, well, then I'm going to starve, right? I'm not going to make good money. But if I really want to make money and take care of myself and leave something for my family, then I have to suffer and work has to be hard and long and miserable, right? And you're saying there's kind of this conception too in the organizational world that it's either we love our people, but we don't make money, we don't incentivize, we don't have good benefits, blah, blah, blah. Or you can have a great career here and make tons of money, but you're probably going to get disrespected on a daily basis. So are you seeing that you have to kind of break down that thinking as well? We do. Absolutely. Yeah. But we have to have people understand that when you have a place of respect, you're going to have more vulnerability. And if I'm able to be vulnerable, I'm willing to put all my ideas on the table, mm. which means you get way more creativity. You yes. get way higher levels of problem solving because you get people bringing ideas that they wouldn't have brought in other organizations because it wasn't safe. They would That's have been ridiculed. They would huge. have been you know, knock down, humiliate it. But because you have a place where all vulnerability is welcome, now all these ideas are being brought forth. You have more diversity because diverse thoughts brought forward in there and people seek diversity in culture and ethnicity in all forms of diversity because they welcome and respect all human beings. That's amazing. You know, I really, I recently, I do a lot of what I call clarity calls. So they're discovery calls with people who could potentially benefit from one of our programs or services. And we talk about their vision and, and where they are now and what the gap is and if we can address that. And um, recently I was talking to a guy who said that, um, you know, he's like, you know what, in all other ways, I really actually like what I do. I make great money. It's really sustainable. But I have this one guy that I'm working with who literally just puts me down on a daily basis. He's like, wow, that was a stupid idea. Why would we ever do something like that? And it's this one guy. It's this one guy right. who's right, who's literally got him to the point where he's like, I'm done. I'm out of here. Like, I, this is not sustainable anymore. So how can Yeah, you company... probably know the cliche. Yeah. No, tell me. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah, the cliche, right? People don't leave jobs. They leave people. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> they leave horrible they, bosses. They leave... Yeah. Right. They leave back. And it doesn't necessarily, it could be a colleague that I don't know if that's yes. a boss that's doing that. That could be a colleague doing that. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things where a culture of respect and organization wouldn't allow those comments. Right. It would not say, that? what do you, well, you, what you do is you share, we don't use degradation. We use exploration, mm. right? De degradation means, what are you thinking? Why would you say that? right? Exploration is, what do you mean by that? How would that work? 
Very different concepts. One is degradation. It makes you sound like an idiot. What are you thinking? Right? Versus exploration. Hmm. Like I can't even imagine how that would work. So what I'm going to ask you is how would that work? <laughs> but I'm going to be, I'm going to be inquisitive about it. I'm not going to do this. How would that work? Yeah. yeah. So there's an, there's an art they teach when you take improv classes. It's okay. yes. And yes. it's yes. And, and so when somebody comes up to an, with an idea with you and your company, your organization that says, what about this? Am I yes. Anding or am I killing it? You know, we say in the entrepreneurial world, are you, do you have a dream killer in your life? Because mm. a lot of people have dream killers in their life and a lot of people have dream killers in their office. So are you a dream killer or are you an explorer? Like, are you willing to explore what this person means? Huge, huge difference. I love that you called it that because I was just on the, I was just on a call yesterday with two people who are in our digital program right now. Um, and both of them are right in the, in the throes of figuring out like what's their career niche. And we were talking about um, social scripts, this idea that we have these concepts about how the world works or how we're supposed to behave in certain scenarios. And one of the things, and so, you know, the easy way to understand this is like, um, if you walk into a restaurant, there's a script for that that we all kind of understand, right? You, you know that you come in and you kind of stop at the front because you're going to be greeted. They're going to ask you, like, how many people are in your party? When you're ready to be seated, you're going to follow somebody. When you sit down, you know, you, you know to wait to order, right? That's a social script that's kind of an understanding of how Absolutely. a scenario would work, right? So we were talking about when you're shifting your script for, say, in your case, building a culture of respect. In my case, it's finding work that you love or redefining success for yourself. You have to surround people, surround yourself with people who support your script, right? Like I'm not going to go to my yes. mom who's worked at the same company for 30 years and gone to work every day at the exact same time and compare my quote unquote productivity to hers. If I wake up at 10, you know, she's going to look at me and be like, oh, really? 10? When in reality, I work really hard from 10 to maybe six or eight and, and that's just as good for me. So uh, how do you, how do you get, how do you make that mental shift when you're in, let's say, a large organization or when you're surrounded in a social circle by people who haven't traditionally shared the new script that you're now trying to work towards? Well, one neat thing you can do is go to the person that, let's say you're in a system of hierarchy, the mm -hmm. person who's your boss, your management, and say, hey, would you be open to, now notice that language. Yes. Would you be open to Magic people words. being even more vulnerable? Yes, to bring open to to bring forward as even more ideas in our meetings that are really creative and maybe out of the box. Would you be open to that? And if they're like most people are going to say, "Why well, be open to it?" They didn't say they'd do it, right? I'd be open to it. Yeah. Uh, can I share something that I found out works at really helping that happen? Now, odds are they're going to say yes to that. Why wouldn't they? I have found that if people fear judgment, it's the number one killer of really creative idea thinking and problem solving yeah. is the fear of judgment. So can we work as a unit on removing any judgment in the sharing process mm -hmm. so that it becomes exploration versus killing of idea becomes exploration of how. And then in the exploration, we might recognize, oh, it doesn't look like that's going to work with our budget, our priorities, and that's okay. We at least explored it and we're yeah. appreciative for the person bringing it forward. Now, if you do all of that and you are in an environment that says, we just don't have time for that. We don't care about that. Then it's a great opportunity to step back and go, I, this might not be the right place for me right now. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is that because unemployment so low right now, if there was ever a time to change jobs <laughs> and to look for the right community that you do fit in and will really really use what you bring to the table, now is it. Now is it because, yeah, I mean, that's where people go, oh, I can never leave my job. If you're going to leave, you leave when unemployment is down. That, that's like a common sense thing to do because that means everybody's looking for great talent. And if you're great talent, you might end up way better than you are right now. That is so brilliant and wise and, and true, right? That, that I, I try to get this out and, and my sort of economics background is horrible, but it, it makes total sense, right? If, if companies are going, where are we going to find our next great person? And that could be you and you're suffering in a company or an organization or wherever 
that just isn't creating a place where you can feel like you add value, it doesn't appreciate what you bring to the table, is really lacking in respect and openness. Like it is a great time. It makes total sense. And now that yeah, you know, well, like, here's the mis- here's the mistake people make. Yeah. They think, well, I'll do that in a year. Oh yeah, what about when the economy tanks in a year? Mm. And now that same environment is no longer uh, really supportive mm-hmm. of you looking for a new job. So that's yeah. why, what, you know, they always say when it's hot, it's hot. You got to go while it's hot. So if you're thinking that you know if it's not the right place, you talk to most people, they know, but they know when they are settling, right? People yeah. know that. So if you're settling, when the market's hot, stop settling, go be the force you're meant to be somewhere. I love that. How about, let me ask you this, in your experience, because you went out and you started your own business and you've been speaking and hustling and, and working in a, in a field that you feel passionate about and purposeful towards, um, how do you think that you would have identified that had you not had this like very deep personal experience? Like if somebody's out there saying, yeah, man, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I just don't know what I would do instead. What, what advice would you give that person? It's a great question. Uh, I always ask people, if you want to see where your passion lies, just pause and ask yourself what upsets you. Like what oh. ticks you off? What yeah. fires you up? Yes, because my- odds are that's... Yeah, that's some passion inside you that has not been released. I have friends that are so passionate about politics and I'm like, why aren't you working on a campaign? Like you just every day think about this stuff. You belong in that realm. Why aren't you Mm. doing this, right? Mm So I'm gonna look for what what light, somebody makes a comment about something that, and you always light up on that. Mm -hmm. That might be, that somehow that, that force, that energy, that's your passion. Apply that to a gift you have and look for that in the world, if you can combine them. That's beautiful, yeah. So how did you, how did you know you really had the gift to speak, that, that you could you know, um, go unscripted and, and connect with people, or have you just like built it over time? Uh, definitely built it over time. <laughs> I was a, uh, but to be fair, I was born a performer. Yeah. So I was the kid at the family reunion in the, that everybody had a circle around for dancing. And I was the one out there dancing in the middle of the family. Yeah. So I was a ham by all definitions. I was doing theater uh, where I, when I was able to young. And then I went into theater in college. That was my major. Ah. So when I heard this, yeah, when I heard the speaker speak, I had left theater because I was looking for security. After my sister was raped, everything went here. And I was like, oh, yeah. I need security. I want to be family. And I went into entrepreneurship. Now, I know that makes no sense. But uh, <laughs> sure? th- that's what I did, thinking business is more secure than theater. That's what I did at the time. Mm-hmm. Now, the irony of this, the irony of this is that I perform on stages 80 to 110 days a year now uh, wow. and have been for two decades. But here's the reality of how I got there. I did it full time for about two years in college, one year after, and then struggled. And that's the part that people don't tend to talk about, the place that they struggled. And I had to walk away from it for about eight years. I did it here or there. And in 2002, somebody saw me doing this and said, why aren't you doing this all over the world? And it was another speaker. And I gave my backstory and they said, the world's changed. They're ready to hear it now. Because in the early 90s, people really were not discussing this. And we sold the small business I had at the time, almost went bankrupt, but we believe this is where I always belonged in the first place. And we just kept fighting and battling and building. And that part of the business, that was 17 years ago when we made that choice. Wow, that's really awesome, Mike. I really appreciate you sharing that part of your story because I'll tell you too, just from a personal transparency, like I sent out, I send out weekly, um, emails. They're usually like a funny story or something happened that relates back to a career. And But this week I shared a really personal one about how I've been feeling really disaligned with my business recently and, and almost like not excited, like actually not even almost, just very unexcited <laughs> to get up and go to right. work and do the things I was doing because I was living not in my genius zone, which in wealth dynamics is a star. So somebody who, you know, shines and attracts and um, inspires, but I was, I was digging down into the nuts and bolts of the business and doing a lot of operations and a lot of processes, thinking that that's what I quote unquote needed to be doing to scale and be successful, et cetera. 
and and mm-hmm. I've I've been really unhappy, and and that was a big gut check for me as somebody who's literally for a living teaching people how to find work they love. I was like, how did I, how did I have this vision and end up all the way over here? Um, how did you personally? Because I've had to really realign, and, and and I went to a retreat. I don't know if you know Michelle Via Lobos, but I was just in her retreat. I, I do know of yes. She's phenomenal and, and had a total breakthrough and realized like realignment just is going to take me focusing on what I'm amazing at and channeling it towards something that I really care about and then filling in the gaps with other people who love what they do and are just as gifted at what they do and also passionate about what we're working on. So how did you push through that part? Like what, what was it in you that got you through the, the hard part and helped you realize, oh, this is just the part I need to get through to, to get where I want to go and, and didn't allow you to quit? How did you do that? Yeah, I didn't give myself an option. I went so full in 100% that desperation was my motivation. In Ah. other words, I was financially stretching everything because I was like, I'm all in. And anybody Mm. who knows me knows there's only one way Mike's doing something. (laughs) And if he's going to do it, if I'm going to do it well, let's put it that way. I have made, and many times I've made the mistake of trying to do too many things at once. But if I'm going to do something well, I'm all in. That's when I do something well, when I'm all in. So I went all in. And when you're all in, that means you're financially all in. You don't have a backup plan. Mm. And therefore, it must work. Like people would come up to me and say, hey, you know, speaking on what you're speaking on, you might want a backup plan, which really said to me, oh, you expect me to fail. (laughs) And so- I would keep saying to myself, I, that's not, there, we're not making a plan to fail. Mm, we're making a plan yes. to succeed. Yes. And so it was just go, go, go. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't nights of tears because of financial creditors calling and struggles. And, I, and I'm married and I'm thankful I have a partner who believed in the journey. But it also yes. means it can be tough on the partner at times. It can be tough on kids at times. All of that. So you really have to believe in what you're doing and see the end vision of what you're shooting for. And even when you get to places of great success by some people's standards, you're going to have days and you're going to have years that have dips. Years, maybe at a time. And so you got to believe in what you're doing in those moments. I think that's a really beautiful place for us to wrap up, actually, because what, what it sounds like drove you through this whole thing was the purpose behind what you were doing. that You connected so deeply with the change you could make in the world, with, with the cause that you just couldn't not talk about. And that's something that we, you know, in all of our programs at the nth degree teach is like, if you can connect with something that drives you that deeply and that passionately, I mean, forget it. You're unstoppable at that point. Um, and you're, you're speaking right. directly to that. So thank you so much for being just a beautiful witness to what purpose and passion can really do. And we overplay passion and what's your passion and whatever, but I think it's purpose. I think it's intention behind the work that you're doing. So um, so I want to end with this then. If, if somebody's looking for work they love, they want to feel respected, they want to feel valued, um, they're just maybe not sure where to get started. What's the advice that you would give them uh, to finally feel like they belong in a great in a great organization? Well, one, I would do some self-work. I, I believe that in a, there's a book, called, and this isn't my book, uh, there is a book called Unique Ability. Shannon Waller wrote it, co-authored it. Unique Ability. Start there. Take the exploration on what you really belong doing because your mm. unique ability is true of you when you were a child. It's true of you today. And then you can look at your unique ability and say, where is this applicable in the world? Where can this be used in the world? See, people will make a mistake of thinking unique ability is a skill. And it's way more than that. And I don't want to give it away because the book will share that. But people look at me and go, oh, your unique ability is speaking. Nope, it's not. <laughs> that's, the, that's the medium I share it in. Yes. But my unique ability is creating aha moments that uncover discoveries. Yes. That's my unique ability. Now that can show up in my writing, that can show up in my speaking. So I can look at, that could show up in doing media and my podcast. So you look at where are all the mediums it can show up in and then I can pursue those avenues. Yes, I love that. That's such a perfect place to to wrap up for today. Mike, if people wanna get in touch with you, they wanna learn more about the Center for Respect, they want you to come speak at their organization, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, thank you for asking, Tracy. Yeah, absolutely. Two websites that are easy, centerforrespect.com. So centerforrespect.com and or mikespeaks.com. 
So MikeSpeaks.com is specifically for corporations, businesses, organizations, uh, large nonprofits. Center for Respect is everything, schools, universities, military, everything. So they can choose between them. And, and of course, they can always catch us on the podcast. The okay. podcast is called the Respect Podcast. So it doesn't get any easier. You're amazing. I a, a just like bow down to somebody who could get the URL MikeSpeaks.com because I know that probably wasn't easy. And then the Respect Podcast, like that's so direct and simple and beautiful. I can't believe somebody hadn't taken it already. So you are you're batting a thousand, my friend. Um, so well, thank you so thank much you. for I being here. It. Yeah, this is just a beautiful conversation. I think you're adding so much value to the world in a time where finally, like you said, people are listening. Awareness is high, and now you get to live the reality of of making behavioral change, which as we all know is the hardest part, but really the part that creates societal and cultural change. So thank you for the work that you do in the world. Well, thank you, Tracy, for the energy you're putting out to the world. Your show's awesome. I loved your energy on our show. Just that purpose, that passion, it's powerful and you're making a huge impact. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Mike Do Domish? Yes. Got him. All right. Uh, thank you again for being here. You, of course, have been watching the Nth Degree TV, the place to be to take your career from stuck to unstoppable. I loved uh, having the show for you today. I love uh, having these amazing guests to share their incredible knowledge with you. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you on the next episode of the Nth Degree TV.